um, there were folders going around, and there hopefully will be plenty for everybody. I can always make more, uh, but they're in the back, and uh, I'll go ahead and tell you what you can be doing even before we start broadcasting. Um, pretest. So on the what will be probably the third page of your booklet, there is a First Corinthians pretest. You can be filling that out. Get a pen, get a pencil, and uh, you'll benefit from assessing your preliminary knowledge of the book of 1 Corinthians. And so you can be working on that. Really, we're going to be spending the first uh, seven, ten minutes of class just working on that. Uh, so the red light means we're live, I guess. So if you're joining us via the live stream, welcome. Um, there is material that we'll be using for this class. So uh, if you're in the auditorium, there are folders in the back. You can grab one. Um, and uh, or maybe raise your hand and the boys will be nice enough to bring you one. If you're at home, as it says on the screen, you can access this material on our website. In fact, I would encourage you to do that right now um, if you don't want to be spending the next 10 minutes silently looking at uh, your computer screen. Go to the website, get the material, and find the pretest, and you can be working on that with everybody else in here. And that's the first thing we're going to do in this new quarter. Looking up the answer does not help you at all. Uh, that's what this is for. And uh, make an educated guess. Notice the second and the third sections are, you know, they're limited choice answers. So you can work on your process of elimination for those. But uh, do your best. Skip ones if you feel like you don't know. Come back to it. Okay, let's uh, go over these, and I will try to get back to the rhythm that we had uh, in the judges class where, you know, there's something quick to throw out there. If I've asked for, um, you know, quick answers, you can just yell it out, and I'll try to repeat the things that are said. If you do have something longer, a question to ask, a uh, longer comment to make, raise your hand, wait for a microphone to get to you, and that way everyone in here and at home can and here, I would imagine for the pretest, we can basically yell out our answers. So yell out answers as before. Maybe once you answer, you know, wait a little while to, to jump back in the game. But uh, let's see how you did here. Okay, who wrote 1 Corinthians? Yeah. Oh, resounding. Hey, you got to throw it in there. I felt bad. I kind of gave it away a little, you know, in the next question. But uh, When was 1 Corinthians written? I said circa 55, so we'll, we'll, give, we'll give Michael credit for, uh, for 53. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, and there, but there happens to be some variation uh, in terms of when exactly, so there's a margin of error here. But around 55, and uh, we can maybe talk more about that if you're interested. From where was 1 Corinthians written? Ephesus, that's right. Yeah, uh, Ephesus just keeps coming up. There's just, it's all over the New Testament. But Paul was, uh, as far as we know, in Ephesus when this was written. Where do we read about the founding of the church at Corinth? Okay, it is the book of Acts. It is, it is 18. Mike had that one from the back. Um, Acts 18. And how long was Paul in Corinth? About three years. Yeah, eight, three half years. Um, so 18 months, uh, the text says. Probably that's the entirety of the stay, but at least 18 months. Whoops. Um, and what happened? Anybody remember any events from uh, Paul's time in Corinth? Not a riot, but something may be close. In some ways with the book of Acts, you know, you could, you could say a couple general things and it would hit almost every city Paul went to. Um, but any, anybody want to throw something out there? Anybody want to guess what happened in Corinth? What's the typical pattern of Paul in, in the various cities that he went to? Goes to the synagogue. Gets thrown out. Yep. And in Corinth, uh, there's a couple extra interesting details. One, um, when he gets there, he is making tents. And that's where he meets up with his friends, Aquila and Priscilla, who are also tent makers. But he teaches in the synagogue. 
Uh, it appears while he's there, some support, financial support from Macedonia, perhaps like the church in Philippi, uh, is brought to him by Timothy and some other companions, and that frees up Paul to do more teaching because of the financial support. And so he teaches in the synagogue, he's kicked out, and he's actually brought before the proconsul, Gallio, which, by the way, is how we know some of the exact dating of this, because there's an archaeological inscription with Gallio's name on it, dating to uh, the year 51 or 52. Um, but, uh, you know, they, the Jews try to cause trouble. Paul uh, doesn't get beat or stoned like he does other places, but he does move on after that trouble is caused. Okay, well, again, we may have opportunity to dive more into the background, but uh, what do you want to say about the overall message of the book of 1 Corinthians? Shout out some things you had. Right, wrong, indifferent, love, discipline. What else did you put down? Overall message. Edify the church. Stay free from sin. Other things? Say that again. What it means to receive the word of God. The resurrection. Yeah, yeah the transition, Brian says, of First Corinthians 15. Um, yeah. The climax, perhaps. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not going to give you anything. So when I click this, there's not going to be an answer that pops up. Uh, so we'll get there, but I just wanted you to be thinking about what do you know are the big ideas of the book of 1 Corinthians. Okay, first we'll do sections, and then we'll do where is it found in the book. Okay, so again, process of elimination, uh, hopefully you were able to do okay. Which chapters talk about meat sacrifice to idols? Not 14? Not 7? Yeah, I think someone said, Rick says, 8 to 10 is meat sacrifice to idols, okay? Uh, spiritual gifts. Which one? Uh, yes, F is 12 to 5. I don't remember what the letters are, Dan, but that's exactly right. 12 to 14. Resurrection. 15. Okay, again, this is a, perhaps the climax of the book. Um, divisions. By divisions, we mean factions, uh, that sort of thing in the church. Yeah, A. Say the numbers, guys. I okay, you know, uh, have the, the, the chapter numbers in my head. Yes, A, uh, 1 to 4 is the factions in the church. Collection for needy saints. Not 11. Chapter 16. Yep. Uh, not the whole chapter, but that first paragraph of 16 deals with the first day of the week collection. So there won't be a need when Paul gets there. He can just take the money and run, so to speak. Um, immorality and worldly influence. It's a little bit broad, but there's two chapters it covers. Immorality and worldly influence. Yeah, five and six. We typically think of, of five as the church discipline, the man who's living in sin. Six as the lawsuit among believers. Uh, but we'll, we'll put those together for our purposes this quarter and uh, make it one section. All right, there's only two left, so 50-50 chance. Questions about marriage. Chapter seven. And then the traditions received from Paul, also a way of putting two together um, that may or may not go uh, perfectly together. But that's in chapter 11 where Paul deals with both the head covering men and women's roles in the assembly as well as the tradition, uh, the apostolic tradition of the, of the Lord's Supper that they were mishandling in their assembly. Okay, and then let's go to the where is it found. So uh, one for each chapter. Therefore, my beloved brother, steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I think I heard 15, but if not, that's it. Uh, 1558, so perhaps the climactic verse of the climactic chapter. Second one, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? I started to hear the beginning of it. It is six, yeah. Uh, we're single chapters now, but yes, uh, that your body is a temple is chapter six in the discussion of immorality. Love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous. Thirteen. Okay. Um, next one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. 
Not one. Not two. Almost there. Chapter three. Yeah. Um, I am of Paul. I kind of condense this a little bit. People are saying, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ, Paul says. Is Christ divided? That is chapter one. Yeah, that's got that one. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. All things to all men that I might by all means save some. It is chapter 9. Yep. On the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so there be no collections when I come. That is 16. I determined to know nothing. Covered up a little bit, sorry. Determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Not 15. Chapter 2, yeah. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Chapter 8. Therefore, take heed, he who stands, uh, take heed lest he fall. This is no temptation overtaking you is common to man. God will provide a way of escape. Chapter 10, yeah. Okay. Uh, The body is one, yet many members, members of the body, though they are many, are one body. Not 15. Yeah, we are. We're, we're whittling them down here. So, This is 12. Uh, what about a little leaven leavens the whole lump? That's five. That's the church discipline, uh, the man and immorality. Let all things be done for edification. 14. And there's three left here. The kingdom of God does not consist in words but in power. It's chapter 4. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. Chapter 7, and then finally, um, in giving this instruction, Paul says, in reference to the Lord's Supper, I do not praise you, for you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. And that is the beginning of the section of chapter 11 that we quote very often around the Lord's table. Uh, I deliver to you, um, you know, the, the, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, that's your pretest, and you will see these questions again. I can almost guarantee that. Um, but again, these are important things to be able to do, locating not only where certain topics are dealt with, but, uh, but locating even specific verses. I do not expect that before the quarter that we'll be able to nail all of these, but I want to give you a sense of how you are in terms of your specific knowledge at the moment, And so we can uh, understand where we're headed and know in three months how much you have learned, which I'm sure will be quite a bit. Okay, let's talk about the goals. This is across the page from your pretest. And uh, the goal of any class, any Bible class that we have, the the ultimate goal is to to change, okay, to be better. We want to be better people. That's why we studied the Bible. Uh, Well, you know, you could argue with that, I guess. We study to know God, and, and in knowing God, we, we become conformed to His image. And so we want to change. We want to be better. But changing our actions, I will suggest to you, especially in this quarter, begins with the changing of our thinking. And so we want to break up uh, those two ideas. You change the way you think, you change your attitude, you change your heart, and then your actions change as a, as a result of that. And so I've... Uh, presented our goals according to this basic formula, the change of thought and then the change of action, okay? And, the, and the, they stair-step, or they build on each other, um, and this follows if any teachers or, you know, School of Education, Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, they do that in, in education stuff, so it's kind of the stages of learning from the more rote, factual learning to uh, being able to use that information productively, so the first thing we want to do, the first goal is just to become more familiar with the book. That's part of what you see in the pretest. Do you know what topics are covered? Do you know where verses are? Uh, I'm hoping we will all read this book over and over again over the next three months. Okay, Just become more familiar with it. When you start hearing something ready, say, oh, that sounds like 1 Corinthians 4. Okay, But as we become familiar with it, we want to understand the problems that Paul is dealing with. You may have known this. Maybe I should have asked it on the pretest so you would have had a chance to display this knowledge. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, you're probably familiar with the fact that there are a bunch of problems in Corinth. And that really, Paul's letter is almost just like, you know, a list, a going through of, okay, you have this problem, let me try to address that. Okay, there's this problem, let me try to address that. All the way through, okay? 
We want to understand what those problems are. That's not always as easy as it sounds, because there's a lot of things to it. You ever heard, uh, in talking about the epistles, the analogy of like hearing one side of a phone conversation? You ever done that? And there's clearly something wrong, but you can only hear the person talking in the room. So you kind of have to put pieces together to know, well, what is the problem that this person is dealing with? That's the way that these letters are oftentimes. And so with the letter of 1 Corinthians, we have Paul's words. And there will be places where Paul will say, oh, well, you wrote this thing to me. And he'll say, I wrote this thing to you. And it's like, well, we don't have any of that. We don't have what he wrote previously. We don't have what they wrote. So we're having to piece together what are the problems that Paul is dealing with. Uh, some of that is cultural, understanding the the cultural milieu to be fancy the world that they were living in what ideas were popular what was going on in society all these things factor into the church problems and so we want to try to understand what those problems are then we want to understand the principles that paul is putting forth by principle i do a definition a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or chain of reasoning okay in Paul's answers to these problems, okay, Church and Corinth, you have this problem. Let me address that. He doesn't always uh, just say, oh, here's what you do to fix it, okay? Um, maybe you have a friend like this. Maybe your parents were or are like this, okay? You ask them for very specific advice. Just tell me what to do in the situation, and they won't answer you. They'll just say, well, you know, there's this principle, there's this foundational truth that you need to understand and you're like okay but just tell me what to do right uh paul uses principles throughout first corinthians and even when he does have more or less explicit instructions there is something behind that instruction there's a principle that he wants to be grasped um and so we that's what we want to do is understand the principles and then understand how the principles apply to the problems in corinth okay all of this is understanding all that we're talking about here is is uh, looking at 1 Corinthians, understanding what the book is saying, understand how the, the, the pieces connect within the book. But the goal of all of that, finally, is to then synthesize, another fancy word, to take all of that uh, understanding of the applications in 1 Corinthians and then take my life and say, well, hey, I got problems too. Okay, maybe there's problems even within this congregation that are now or could be in the future. I have problems in my life. I have things I'm dealing with. How can I take all of this that I've learned in 1 Corinthians and then synthesize it with my own experience so that by the truth of God's word, I can navigate and live uh, life the way that God has called me to live? Okay? That's the goal for this class. Make sense? Okay, we're going to go about that by uh, using what I'm referring to as cross sections. Um, I tried, yeah, the, the type got messed up, so I apologize for that. Um, there's also some pretty embarrassing typos in the booklet that, of course, once I printed it, I noticed it. But I won't tell you. that You have to find them yourself. Um, but uh, we're going to do seven classes. So almost a third of the quarter, we are going to not quite yet get into, okay, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. We're going to wait on that. Okay? We're going to take seven classes, including tonight, to do what I've called the cross sections of the book. We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay. Then we will spend the majority of the class working through the text. Uh, you'll see we'll, we'll be able to go at a pace that's a little bit more than, uh, or a little bit less, sorry, than one chapter per class, okay? So that should be, give us a, an opportunity for a deeper dive of the text of 1 Corinthians, and then we'll review with one class, all right? Let's talk about what we mean by cross-sections. You guys know what a cross-section is? The uh, science people, uh, geologists. Beth took a geology class and at A&M, so she could tell you about cross-sections. This is what a cross-section looks like, okay? Um, it's the side of something is kind of one way you think about it. It's like something's been cut out, and you can see right in the middle of it, okay? Um, and it's a way to get a different perspective on, uh, on something, like these, uh, these volcanoes here. Um, if you were just on the surface, if you could, you know, kind of see this from overhead or you were, you know, on a boat going in the water, you would see just kind of whatever it is, five or six individual hills or mountains or sets of rocks or whatever, okay? And you could kind of, you know, see them and observe them as just individual uh, islands or individual mountains. Um, 
and think, okay, they're each on their own and not see the fact that if you look from a different angle, look at a cross section all the way across each one, that there are these things under the surface that connect all of these uh, in a row. There are some common elements, okay, and that they're all tied together, right? That's what a cross section is. And that is uh, how we want to go about, at least for the first part of this course, uh, looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Why am I showing you pictures of volcanoes? I'm not done with volcanoes, by the way, uh, in this class. You know, keep that in your mind. But what do we mean when we say we're going to do a cross-section of the book of 1 Corinthians? What we'll do is, we're, instead of, again, uh, an approach that we will end up taking, and I think is the best approach to, to Bible study, which is to go through and read in order as it was written, and look at each chapter, look at each passage, uh, one at a time, Instead of doing that at first, we want to look sideways at the book, all the way across from chapter 1 to 16, and see if there aren't common elements, things that keep popping up throughout the book that you can see from looking at it, you know, across that way. But if you were going through chapter by chapter, by the time you got to chapter 8, you might forget that there was a very similar idea back in chapter 1, because it's been eight weeks since you've looked at chapter 1. But if you look at that, that thread all at one time, you can see, oh man, Paul really talks about X all the time in the book of 1 Corinthians. Okay? Common elements under the surface that keep on showing up. Okay? Words, ideas, phrases that appear from chapter to chapter. Uh, threads, that'd be the other, I, I don't know what metaphor you prefer, but threads is another metaphor. Little threads that run all the way through 1 Corinthians. Uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 16. They're not like the main topics addressed, but they're just ideas that keep showing their head uh, throughout the book as Paul is dealing with the main topics at hand. Okay, And what they do is they tie together, to continue that metaphor, they tie together these topics. Like what in the world does taking of the Lord's Supper have to do with there's a man who has immorality in the church? Or what in the world is Christians going to uh, court against one another? have to do with how uh, speaking in tongues should be handled in the assembly. Like These seem like unrelated or hard-to-relate uh, problems, but maybe if we look under the surface, there are things that connect all of these. Okay, um, So, once we do that, then, I think, as I'll suggest, our understanding, our identification of those things will help us when we then start to go through chapter by chapter, and uh, our understanding will be enhanced, at least what I hope that it will, okay? Questions or comments on that? Okay, what in the world is he talking about? Let's do an example. We got about 15 minutes left, uh, a little more, and I want to do, do one to, to practice, okay? Although it's not unimportant, but I, but I do want to do it together in the first class to practice, and then you will be on your own. So, in your, in your booklet, okay, go to the page where uh, it says on the right side, Cross section number zero, okay, because your first one for real will be yours to do before Sunday. But look at this. So let's look at this uh, together uh, of cross section zero. Um, I want you to take a few minutes, and you see on the left side of your page, there's just a sampling of verses. Now, uh, you'll see uh, on the right side the, the instructions. I'm asking you to do this, okay? Uh, I think it would be great if we can all commit to this. Before every class... I want you to read all of 1 Corinthians. It'll take you about an hour, okay? Play an audio book, get the app on your phone, go to BibleGateway.com. It'll play audio right through your computer, okay? Just listen to it and follow along in your Bible or read it out loud. You know, you and somebody in your family, read it to each other, one chapter apiece. About an hour, give or take, read through all of the whole letter. Okay, that's the best thing to do. Then, when you do your cross-section, you're going to look at these verses and just spend some time staring at them, going one at a time, going through... They're in the booklet, so you can mark and circle and highlight all you want. And look for the thread. Look for the commonality. Look, what, it, what is it that connects all of these, these verses together? Okay. I've picked these out. So at least in my weird brain, there is something each class period that's just all of these are connected by a single idea. So what is that single idea that connects all of the passages? Um, and I will uh, uh, suggest as you're doing this, only go look it up in your Bible and read the context if 
you just have no idea what the verse is talking about. And, and some context will help you remember, oh yeah, that's in you know, this, this part of the book. But other than that, just, just look at the verses I've given you, the sample, the cross section here, and look for the common thread. Okay, let's do it. Um, we'll give you maybe five minutes or so, maybe a few more. We're actually right on time. Uh, well, kind of. Um, but it take five minutes or so and look at, on cross-section zero, all of the verses and find the thread, find the common theme. <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at it? What is the, uh, let's see, I think I have these up here. What is the common idea through all these of uh, these verses here? Ian? Uh, oh, go Ian and then Brian. I'm seeing a lot of themes uh, about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, Brian? Well, I tried to look at key words. We're looking at the revelation of Christ that brings wisdom, that changes men's hearts, that result in their works, giving ultimately the reward or praise of God, um, and the works being running the race and being um, uh, persevering to the end and receiving the reward at the end, and then the end being the first fruits being Christ and those who follow after him. Something along those lines. Other, other things. I, I want to... I assume you're working on this, though. What other things did y'all see? Because a lot, lot out there. Ian, behind you, uh, Mike, and then Leeds in the back, Alex. You know. Talks about the day of the Lord or end of ages, end of time, and all, uh, every one of these verses. Okay. Lee? Um, but what I wrote down first was the end. Um, the return, there's a reward, there's all the things that will be focused on as the conclusion or the con I guess the actual finishing or completion of our salvation. Yeah. Um, one up here, or uh, well, I'll ask you this. Okay, so all of those, in some way, relate back to um, maybe the shortest way is the way Lisa, the end. Okay, um, the day of the Lord. Okay, uh, that's mentioned as as we've said, um, really in, in every one of these verses. Okay, so if that's true, that this is something Paul talks about a lot. What might that tell us about the overall message of the book? It's a little bit harder since we haven't really studied the book yet. Um, but if, if our first observation is, man, and I, I could have, there, there were more that I, could, that I left out for space, uh, for space okay? Uh, but if, man, in every single chapter, just about, Paul mentions the end, the day of the Lord, uh, what might that say about the message of 1 Corinthians? You better be ready for the end. You, so you got to be ready for the end? Uh, yeah, we might call that um, urgency, okay, preparedness, Lee? That it was something that the Corinthians were, were concerned about, um, and that he addresses it overall. Um, obviously, it was something that they were either confused about or really concerned about. Sure, yeah. Uh, Ian? A time to look forward to that is much more important than the present. And then I think I don't know what else I have, have up here. Um, how does this help un understand the book better? Well, that's maybe the same answer to the uh, to the question that we just asked. Um, but I think again, in some ways, this is an example exercise. So now you know what to do doing cross section one uh, at home before before Sunday. But it's not just that. Um, I think that this is something we should take note of. Maybe we'll have opportunity to talk more about. Okay, um, the church in Corinth has problems. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and in addressing each of those problems, Paul can't help but continue to refer to this thing that's out there in the future. And really, I think the way Paul talks about it, he's not talking about it as some distant, far-off thing. Remember, God's view of time is not the same as ours, okay? So it's more about the urgency. It's coming. It's going to happen. And he uses that, I, I think you could even look at these verses, in a few different ways. Okay, so um, in some of these verses, the return of Jesus is a uh, hope and a motivation for these uh, Christians that are laboring. Okay, so like in uh, the first one, chapter one, he's encouraging them, okay, uh, that they are, they are waiting eagerly. That should be their motivation. 
uh, for Jesus who will confirm you at the end, blameless in his day. Okay. Um, chapter 3, verse 12, the third one on here, it's a motivation of you got to do good work because there's going to be a day where all of that will be revealed. I would, that, there's maybe an interpretive question with that verse, and some of these you, we could maybe uh, debate. Is that really talking about the end, the end, or is Paul just saying, hey, a day's going to come where the things you've done are going to be put to the test, and it's going to reveal, are you straw or brick? Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to entertain that. Uh, but if, especially if that is the end, you're looking forward to this time when a judgment will come. That's a motivation to make sure that what we're doing is uh, solid, solidly built. Okay. Uh, chapter 5, the whole motivation of, of discipline, church discipline, is to save the man's soul in the day of Jesus Christ, and the day of Lord Jesus. Chapter 6, the whole reason we keep our bodies free from sexual immorality is because our bodies will be raised out of the grave in the same way Jesus' was. Okay? These aren't just like disposable things that, you know, use them, throw them away, they have no eternal significance. No, the resurrection gives eternal significance to uh, our lives and the use of our bodies, um, so on and so forth. So it's a hope, it's a motivation for the way that we live now, okay? It's also some other things, and this was alluded to by one of the comments. The end of the age is a reminder of what matters and what doesn't matter, okay, in the book of First Corinthians. So the second one, chapter 2, verse 6. The wisdom we speak is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age, which are passing away, right? There's a big thing in, in, Corinth, in 1 Corinthians about wisdom of the world or wisdom of God, okay? And the point here is one of those is eternal, and one of those is of this age, and this age is coming to a close, okay? Then the rulers are passing away, right? Um, same thing, uh, perhaps, in, uh, in, verse, uh, in chapter 4, verse 5, okay? Uh, if you're having a hard time knowing who to listen to, um, then uh, just, you know, uh, just wait. Wait until the day of the Lord comes. It'll show who's important. And then chapter 7 uh, and 31, maybe most clearly, um, whether it's marriage, whether it's occupation, whether it's wealth, Paul's point in chapter 7, at least in this uh, portion of it, is live as though you have a loose grip on all the things in your life, okay? Uh, because these things are passing. The form of this world is passing away. So don't let the things of this age uh, become, you know, what you're seizing and holding on to. Uh, there's some perspective there. Um, and then maybe all of that could be summarized in, or I, I think encapsulated in the statement in chapter 10, where Paul is referring to the stories of the, the Israelites in the wilderness and says in chapter 10, verse 11, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Uh, one author has described what Paul is saying here as the overlapping of the ages. Okay? The Bible talks about the present age and the age to come. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, we're living right at the overlap of those two things. Okay? The kingdom of God has come. Jesus has brought salvation. And we're just waiting for him to come back and bring it all to a close, to bring his people home and to establish that kingdom forever, okay? Uh, and to do away once and for all with darkness and unrighteousness and wickedness, so on and so forth. But we're not there yet. That has, there's a down payment of that. There, we, are the, we are the beginning of that, but we're not there yet. And this present age, the age in which uh, the, the prince of darkness reigns and there is sin and wickedness, um, we're still living in that but we know it's coming to an end. So we are living in the most critical time in human history, the overlap of the ages. That should give us some perspective on the seriousness of our situation, should give us perspective on uh, who we are together, what our relationships with each other should be, what our relationships should be with the world, uh, so on and so on and so on. Okay, um, So, no accident is my point that Paul refers uh, so often, again, pretty much in every topic, every chapter, to the end of the age, uh, to the return of the Lord, and to the passing away of this present age and the, the uh, establishment of the age to come. Okay, your homework is cross-section one. Read through all of 1 Corinthians, look over those next verses, use your booklet to mark, highlight, etc., uh, et 
and then use the questions to guide you, and we will use that in class on Sunday. Thank you guys so much.